Welcome back to the English Pronunciation Workshop at Southern Utah University. This video is going to focus on rhythm patterns in English and also talk about special vowel combinations and how they impact spelling, reading, and pronunciation. So we've been talking a lot in this workshop about pronunciation and linguists often categorize pronunciation features into two main categories segmentals, which include our consonant and vowel sounds, and supersegmentals, which include sounds that be, go beyond individual sounds and impact how pronunciation works across words, sentences, and larger connected speech. So supersegmentals are things like stress patterns, which we've already talked about, word stress and sentence stress. And then we'll also talk about rhythm in this presentation and our final presentation will discuss intonation patterns in English. As we mentioned, and we're just gonna review again, stress patterns in English are indicated through slower, louder, and higher pitch in our voice. So when we wanna indicate that a syllable is stressed, we will say it more slowly, loudly, and with the higher pitch, and we'll do the same when we want to stress one word over another word. And as we mentioned, in English, phrasal or sentence stress patterns involve stressing the content words, nouns, verbs, adjective, adverbs, and not stressing function words, which tend to be prepositions, articles, pronouns, auxiliary verbs, those kinds of grammatical terms. So English is a stress-timed language, which is different than a syllable-timed language. In a syllable-timed language, which is represented by our group of soldiers at the top, every syllable receives equal stress and equal time in the pronunciation of that phrase. And so it's more like a soldier march. It's a rhythm is repetitive, it is constant, it is consistent. But English is not a syllable timed language. It's a stress timed language. And because of that, we have clusters of stress and things that are unstressed are grouped around and clustered with things that are stressed. And so there are syllables and words that are not stressed that get kind of squished into a stressed syllable or a stressed word. And then we have some others that get grouped into another stressed syllable or stressed word. And so because of this, English sounds different. This also makes English sometimes challenging to listen to because not every word and syllable is expressed clearly. Because when it's unstressed, the vowel sound may move towards the middle of the mouth and get the schwa sound, and the vowel may almost disappear sometimes. And so this can be a challenge, but the more we understand this, the easier we can be for us to improve our listening skills, and we can also produce spoken English, which sounds more natural to an English speaker and makes it easier for them to understand the speech that we're providing. So here is a sentence that is repeated multiple times. And each time some function words are added to the sentence, but no new content words are added. The idea here is that as we add the function words, the amount of time it says to say each sentence does not change. Even mm -hmm. though there are more words and there are more sounds, it still takes the same amount of time. And this represents how English is a stress timed language. There's only three stressed words in this sentence, whether we deal with the first sentence or the last one. And because of that, they all take the same amount of time. What this also means then is that the additional words or syllables that are added have to be spoken quickly in order to fit into the same amount of time. So let's listen to each sentence and hear how the function words get squished or grouped in with the stressed unit or the stressed word near them. First, birds eat worms. Second, the birds eat worms. Third, the birds eat the worms. Fourth, the birds will eat the worms. And finally, the birds will have eaten the worms. In each case, those function words like the or will 
or even that extra syllable, eaten, get squished into the stressed word and become part of it, saying almost the same amount of time for each part. So this, as we mentioned, this can make listening skills a little more challenging, but it can also, by following this pattern, we can make our pronunciation clearer for other English speakers because English speakers are listening to the stressed words. That's where the most meaning is. That's where the greatest importance in the sentence is. And if we're stressing every word, it is harder for an English user's brain to process the sentence and identify the meaning. They're used to just listening primarily to those stressed words because that's where the main meaning is. Here's uh, another couple sentences that I found in a lecture, a uh, live transcript from a classroom discussion about statistics and data analysis. I want you to take a moment and look at these sentences and identify the content words versus the function words. Which words are going to receive the stress in these two sentences? If you like, you can pause the video, think about it, and compare your answers with mine. So here I've highlighted in black the words that are the primary content words. If these sentences are spoken fluently, the black words are the words that will receive the most stress. Now what I've done is I've grouped the words into stress units. So all the white words that are grouped with a black word are likely to be said very quickly and the stress will remain on the black word in each line. Now with the first sentence, we can see that there's many function words in that sentence. And so especially with that phrase, that it's as much an art, all of those words are gonna get squished together with art. But in the second sentence, there were far more content words. And so each of those words is going to be heard much more clearly because there's not as many function words to be squished together, except for that phrase could come up with. So if you'd like, you can pause and you can practice saying these sentences. I'm gonna say them in a moment and you can compare your pronunciation of these sentences with my own. When it comes to data analysis, I want you to remember that it's as much an art as it is a science. So two people given the same data set could come up with very different rules. And that's the rhythm of English. The rhythm of English isn't based on the words. It isn't based on the syllables. It's based on which words are the stressed words. And then the other words and syllables that are not stressed will group around those stressed words and syllables. One way to practice is to do what we've just done there. Help students identify content and function words and then help them to group words into these stressed units to produce a more natural sounding pronunciation. Another way is to do some chants or to do practice repetition to help students just get used to that rhythm of how English might work. Now here is an exercise where you could start backwards with a sentence, start with the stressed word, add some more words to it and help students get familiar with the rhythm of how some words will be stressed and others will not. So if we wanted to go with the phrase, if only I'd known, we could start with the last, known, I'd known. Now listen there, that I'd, is unstressed. And so it gets kind of squished into the known. It should take as much time to say known as it would take to say I'd known. Known, I'd known. And then we can add another stress unit to it. If only. Now I'm really saying two words there, if and only, but it's going to sound more like if only. If only I'd known. If only I'd known. And we're seeing that we're getting some stressed units there. You can do the same one. This one follows a very similar pattern. Study, to study. Not to study, but to study. I need to study. I need to study. Not I need to study, but I need to study. So these kinds of exercises can be helpful in helping students hear and recognize the rhythm of English and possibly start producing that rhythm of English for themselves when they speak. So let's shift now and talk about some special vowel sounds. 
We've been learning a lot about how to decode words uh, and different patterns in English spelling systems. Now in our workshop, we won't be able to cover all the different patterns that exist in English spelling, but we wanna learn about a few others that could be helpful and that can help your students better predict pronunciation of written words in English. So first let's talk about the double L. When double L comes after a vowel, we could consider this a special vowel combination because it can make some special sounds. And so we have double I with the I with the double L, E double L, U double L, O double L, and A double L. Now, the good thing is that I and E don't have any special sounds. We can pronounce these as we would expect as a short vowel sound with two guardians. So the words will, skill, or tell, and swell, there's no surprises there. Those words follow what we've already learned about the phonetic skills and the prediction that these follow phonetic skill two, two guardians, so a short vowel. However, when we deal with U double L, there are two pronunciations. One of them uses the short U sound, which is what we would predict using phonetic skill number two. The other sound is that high back sound in the word like book, uh, the uh sound. So we have uh, which is a short U, but we also have uh, uh, uh. And unfortunately, U double L can produce both sounds. And there isn't always a good way to predict which sound it's going to make. Um, so it's just good to alert students that there are these two pronunciations and they just have to memorize which pronunciation each word uses. So we have dull and gull, but we also have full and skull that use more of the uh sound. O double L. O double L we would predict following phonetic skill two would use the short O sound, but in fact, O double L in English consistently produces with a small exception, the long O sound. So we have words like roll and troll and scroll. So when you see that O double L, that's a special vowel combination that you know produces the long O sound. Now, one exception is the word doll, okay? A toy doll, maybe a small baby that a child might play with. Uh, and that does follow phonetic skill number two. Uh, it doesn't make a special vowel sound. It's a short O, ah, doll. Now, when we get to a double L, this one actually produces a short O sound. Um, and so this is a great one to recognize that pattern, a double L is a special vowel sound. So tall, small, fall, they don't produce the short A sound, which would be a, ah. instead they produce the short O sound, which is ah, tall, small, and fall. So if we were to mark these words, and when we are marking words, um, the word small, for instance, we'd mark our blend, and then we'd see, we'd mark our vowel, the A, and we'd notice that it has the double L behind it. And so we could put an arc underneath it to remind us that that combination makes an unusual uh, vowel sound that does not follow phonetic skill number two. Uh, and so that's the way you could mark those double Ls uh, when you're teaching students how to mark words. And that's just a reminder to us is this doesn't follow phonetic skill number two, it has a special vowel combination. So this is especially helpful when you're dealing with the O double L and the A double L. All right, let's talk about N K and N G combinations. First, let's talk about them with the letter E. And the first thing to notice is that there are no E N K words in English, except words that may, may start with the letter K and have a prefix EN at the beginning. Otherwise, ENK just isn't an English sound. It just doesn't exist. Even the ENG combination is quite rare in English. Um, and I've listed the words that it occurs in. Um, and when it does occur, ENG, it has two sounds. So we have English and England, okay, that use the long E sound. But then we also have the words strength and length that use the long A sound. 
So this is an unusual, a special vowel combination. Uh, you won't see the ENK. If you see the ENG, you could again, you know, mark the vowel and put the arch or the arch underneath it to remind yourself or your students that it makes a special sound. Now with the UNK, UNG, and the ONK, ONG combination, there's no problem here. These make the vowel sounds we would predict following phonetic skill uh, number two. It's a short U and the short O. So a word like shrunk makes the sound we would expect. The word long, ah, uh, makes the sound we would expect. So no problems with O or U. But we do get some special sounds with the A and K and the A and G combination. We might predict following phonetic skill number two that they would make the short A sound, but in fact, they make the long A sound. So that's a good one to recognize. When you see that A and you mark the A and then you notice there's an NK or an NG right after it, loop them together with an arc. That's a special vowel combination. So the word blanket and the word slang, those are special vowel combinations. And the I-N-K, I-N-G, is also a special vowel combination. Instead of making a short I, it actually makes the long E sound. So we have the word drink and the word spring. And same thing, you'd mark it with the X, you'd notice the N-K or the N-G after it, and you'd put an arc to remind yourself that it's going to make that special combination. So the word pink for instance, could be marked this way to remind us it's not going to make a short I sound. It makes that short E or the long E sound. So in this video, we talked about the right rhythm patterns of English and how English is a stressed timed language. Then we also introduced some special vowel combinations with double L endings, the NK and the NG endings, and how those can affect the vowel sounds in words that have those combinations.